Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Talking with Heroes talk show program. I am Bob Calvert, the founder and host of this program. Uh, we're at talkingwithheroes.com, and our new nonprofit is at thankyouforyourservice.us. And some months back, I started talking with some local people here in San Antonio, Texas. And right now, we're at St. Pedro uh, Presbyterian Church. They were very kind to agree to let us use a, a room here so we could uh, sit down with some veterans and sit down with some military support groups and also a couple gentlemen, both veterans, from USAA. And uh, so we're going to get started. This is a it's always an honor to talk to veterans, but you know, when they're family, it just adds a whole bunch to it. And then when you have two family members together, which I've never had the opportunity to do before, it's even better. Um, to my left is my son-in-law, um, Staff Sergeant Keith Knights, and to my right is my brother, recently retired from the Army, Captain Ted, uh, Ted Calvert. And so, um, why don't you introduce yourselves, just talk a little bit maybe about your service and really what you want to talk about. So I'm former uh, Army um, Staff Sergeant Knights. Um, I have four kids, uh, married uh, 15 years. I really respect what Bob has done with his time and what he's tried to pull together with all the nonprofits and, and um, different groups. I really uh, wanted to stay in here t or sit here today and say that I appreciate the uh, groups like Wounded Warrior Project and uh, Project Sanctuary. I, I think we're going to get into that later. Um, yeah. Anything, anything else to add? Yeah. Get this started. Hi, Ted. Go ahead. So it's, it's a dangerous thing to give your little brother the microphone. I'm telling you right now, this could get kind of rough. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, my name is Ted Calvert, and I am actually bilingual in the sense that uh, I was prior enlisted Air Force and I retired as a soldier. So uh, I used to tell everybody I could speak Air Force and Army, which is a valuable uh, commodity these days. Um, I had almost 14 year break in service and in the interim I did a couple different things. Uh, owned my own laboratory and just not sure what I want to be when I grow up yet kind of thing. And uh, sure do appreciate everything that Bob has done and is doing right now. and. Uh, you can't do enough to help out those who have served and have come back and uh, you know just need need that support and Bob thank you very much for doing that okay so Keith you uh, had two deployments to Afghanistan do you want to talk a little bit about that two deployments to Iraq uh, yeah, no it's fine uh, one to Bakuba Iraq and the second one was to Missoula. Um the first one was to set up the infrastructure for their uh, um, voting system uh, for, so they can have a um, type of democracy like as such as we do and the second time was for us to in, uh, in, um, help them procure that to initiate the entire process or not to initiate but to help them resolve the entire pro uh, process so after they voted make sure all the streets tr streets are um, uh, prepared and so they can go back and forth to the voting booths and do what they needed to do safely and um, be protected protected to do that also to um, train the uh, local forces and make sure that they are knowledgeable enough to know that they can um, use what they needed to do to be um, um, trained uh, local forces um, anyway yeah I know a number of times when I went over there, um, they would be having elections, yes. and you'd see them lined up, and then they'd come out with this little purple thing on their fingers, and it made me think about back here, so many people that don't vote, right. and they would risk their lives. Yeah. yeah, the Iraqi people, they were very proud to show that they were ink-stained from voting in the booths, um, and they would let us take pictures of them and post it and show other people that they had voted. And it was very dangerous for them to do so because it would also let all the insurgents know that they had done so and made themselves targets. Uh, but yeah, it made me feel proud that what we were doing over there was proof of what we had accomplished. Uh, and yes, well, like Bob said, that so many people back home take it for granted and don't vote, but yeah, exactly. And Ted, talk about your deployment. You were over in Afghanistan. Yes, I was over in Afghanistan at uh, 
uh, Camp Arena, which uh, was actually a NATO uh, FOB, uh, forward operating base. Uh, Camp Arena means Camp Sand. You know, imagine that over in Afghanistan. And we had lots of that. And it was actually uh, owned by the uh, Spanish, if you will, or Spanish-led with a, just a multinational presence on there. And so we, we work with just about everybody. Um, I was in the laboratory. It was just myself and a Spanish officer. And so it was really interesting perspective on how uh, operations went. Like, you know, translators weren't English to Dari or English to Pashto. They, they were Spanish to Dari. So, you know, you, you, you always had an interesting twist going on. Uh, we really did make sure that we took care of a lot of Afghani nationals. I would say 90% Bob of our uh, medical effort was placed toward taking care of the civilians uh, and really, you know, in the process of winning the hearts and minds. And we really did make a lot of friends, did a lot of really good things over there. And just uh, coincidentally, where I was at, in Herat was where Camp Arena is. Uh, it's about 100 and 100 so miles, a little bit, give or take, from the Iranian border. So we really had a diverse uh, presence there on the FOB. Okay, let's talk a little bit about after you returned. Um, I know both of you have had well, some experience with getting help when you needed help. Some of you have had experiences of not being able to get help. Like you were a commander, so you're going to talk about that in a minute. But Keith, if you could start out. I know you and Adrian, my daughter, um, she served too, not deployed, but you've had an experience with a number of different military support groups. Um, talk about a little bit what happened and what it meant to you. So uh, upon returning home, uh, as we've heard or some of us have experienced firsthand, it's very difficult to be trained to be on your guard or um, deal with the day-to-day -day operations overseas. So there's a lot of great men and women who have dedicated their personal time and um, basically their family uh, structure to um, take care of men and women who have served. And I have had firsthand encounters with these people, uh, Project Sanctuary. Um, has really helped us out. They sent us to um, a, a ranch in Colorado where we got to spend an entire week. They had counselors set up for us, marriage um, uh, marriage counselings. I didn't want to say the same word again. Um, but uh, things for the children to do, horseback riding. They set us up with ATV trips. Um, food galore they had chefs there um, it was just really really an amazing amazing thing and so w what we took away from there is basically tools for those bad times um, when we really want to start throwing things at each other knowledge on how to get back to each other um, the really things that make the dark times seem brighter uh, places like Wounded Warrior Project, uh, they really reach out to us on a weekly basis, maybe sometimes every other week. We always open up our mail and find a, a hey, how you doing? Do you want to get out this week? Go fishing, go driving, go hiking, go something like that. So Wounded Warrior Project, they're really, really great. Um, while I was deployed, uh, there was a company that was uh, Soldiers Angels. Um, they sent me tons of care packages, letters from schools and so, you know, you get a letter from a, a school or a little child that says, you know, soldiers are great, but they would personalize it. They would put the soldier's name, hey, Sergeant Knights, hope you're doing really, really well. And that, that really touches you. That really makes you, makes the days go by really, really fast. Um, so places like that really, really help out. Uh, Operation Heal Our Patriots, they're an amazing company. Uh, it's these people that help that make the homecomings sweeter. I mean, you see your family, that helps. It's really amazing. But companies like this make the glue for your family that much stronger. And uh, yeah, it's really nice. And all of these nonprofits, organizations, and uh, I'm glad you brought up about Soldiers Angels, though, because um, one of the things I think a lot of people around America don't realize, and maybe Maybe in some time in the past, you've helped with getting care packages and letters out. Um, we have a lot of soldiers deployed in many different areas right now. And uh, Soldiers Angels, they're still sending care packages. Um, OIDelivers.org, 
and they sent them to you? I wanted to add one more thing. Um, my wife brought up a great point. She was a part of um, uh, a group that is no longer together. It was a group that helped wives specifically with um, their spouses uh, deal with their issues. Um, and there could be a better uh, outreach program or something that there could be started with uh, uh, a nonprofit or something that could be re, re uh, more of an understanding for wives and their and their spouses. spouses yeah. yeah. Could be a ministry. Yeah. A local church, something right. like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Like they're doing here for us to be here. Right. Sure. And then another one was Operation Gratitude. I think they've gone over 2,000 care packages now. But these, these organizations, there's more of them. They're still out there. So if you feel led to you know, reach out to the, some of these military people that are overseas someplace and with letters or care packages, just you could just put probably care packages to, or on, in Google or Yahoo or something and pull them up. So Ted, now you have, you have some unique perspectives because you were a commander and you had a lot of soldiers under you. And just talk a little bit about what you shared. Well, I will, but I, I, I'm kind of remiss here, and, and I got I to gotta circle the wagon back here. Um, so Keith has mentioned his wife like a couple times and even some thing that, um, yeah, I, I know it's your daughter. I got that. I got that. I, I know who it is. I haven't mentioned my wife, Brenda, once, so I better stop and do something right now. Otherwise, it may get a little rough around here when I go home and, uh, you know, redeployment may be a whole nother thing again. But... Uh, all kidding aside, uh, the organizations that Bob and uh, Keith have talked about, uh, organizations like Operation Gratitude, they were instrumental um, in providing these wonderful care packages, freedom cookies, when you don't even hear of, and just these uh, ladies that love to bake cookies. Um, I could go on. Soldiers Angels also had a big part. Um, really what it was all about was just people taking the time to add that personal touch and even the Spaniards oh my gosh the Spaniards would get excited about the packages that we were getting of course we'd share with them and then I told some of the ladies that we communicated by email and everything hey we've got and they Spaniards here we got Italians and they would try to get individualized uh, novelty desserts for them it was just they were just blown away they went home lifted up so you just don't realize how far that ripple can reach it can go a long ways and really uh, Bob talks about the whole um, well, actually no Keith said the whole thing about spouses um, I echo that because my wife Brenda we really didn't have a whole lot of support when we were downrange even from the FRG at the times and that's the family readiness groups um, it just really wasn't it's, it's tough and, and one of the reasons why I didn't mention my wife, we had a rather unique situation. We actually adopted our two great nieces and great nephew. Uh, it's really interesting in that we met him for the first time one month before I deployed to Afghanistan. Next thing you know, uh, a couple months into deployment, they come. So Brenda had them for, uh, what, almost six months. And our, my grown son moved in to help too. But, you know, very complicated medical needs so you just don't know what the families have and I do have that unique perspective of being in command of um, a unit here at Fort Sam Houston that was comprised of individuals who had an average deployment of about three to four times for about 42 months and um, I would say approximately two dozen Purple Hearts in the group um, all kinds of traumas and and what we don't realize and we don't really talk about a whole lot is the commonplace things of you have three or four deployments and you'll have a equal number of marriages or relationships uh, children from various different relationships and very complicated personal lives when you couple that with the complications from seeing things that that the human human beings are not designed to see we, we just aren't, and it's very difficult to process. It makes for a very dangerous cocktail, and, a, and one that needs a lot of intervention and help. And being in command, I never really saw too many organizations. Now, Bob, he was great. 
and, and, and I got to tell you, I have a shout out to one that I think you'll be hearing uh, later in the day is Vet Trips. And what they did is um, they and other organizations do reach out to active duty, retired, um, separated military, because there really isn't anything such as a, someone that's former, you know, Army or former Marines or former Navy or Air Force. It, it's in your blood and it stays there. And sometimes in your body, in your mind with various issues that you have to deal with for a very long time. A and what I ha saw and I noticed that there was a, a disconnect between the civilian organizations and the actual DOD entities, Army, Air Force, uh, Navy. And I got to see all the branches because at Fort Sam Houston, all of the medical training is there for all three services. And as you, as most of you may, may know, the Marines don't actually, they use the Navy as uh, um, their medical piece. So what we had is all of these soldiers with very complicated issues, but they didn't know where to even start, that there were organizations out there. So that's why I think it is imperative for organizations, you know, whatever you're doing, to make that effort and try hard to get past some of the wonderful red tape that we love to do in the DOD and the, you know we just love it I mean I think we live for that and really get out there and say what you do because even if you can just help one soldier and and I don't know I think you're gonna want me to talk later about some more of that but or do you want me to just go ahead go for it right now alright well I will I'll go in for it right now you know one of the things that is uh, I don't know how it doesn't get our country's attention like it should. You know, we throw the number 22 around. And as you well know, 22 is, you know, the amount of veteran suicides that we have every, every day. Every day. Homelessness among veterans is completely disproportionate to the general population. All of these things are related to the prior statements that I made. We have a serious disconnect. The VA is not there. The act, once, you're, once you're gone from active duty, you know, the organization moves forward. You know, the Army keeps rolling along, as the song goes. And, and that's exactly what happens, and it has to. But the safety net for those who have poured out their hearts, their lives, blood, sweat, and tears, literally, we got to do something about getting it stronger. Because what's happening right now is not working fully in the sense that the VA is not an organization that can turn on a dime. It's huge. And I think it's organizations like, like the ones that we talked about, like Wounded Warrior Project, Vet Trips, uh, the list can go on, Comfort Crew, all of them. I'll, I'll mention, you know, I, and, and if I'm forgetting any, I apologize uh, because there are so many. It's those organizations that I believe that can bridge that crucial gap, that can make the difference in one life. And you know, I, I see my uh, nephew sitting here, and, and I know what a difference that these organizations have made in, in, in his life and in my niece's life and their four beautiful children. A and I know that organizations like that can make the difference. And I encourage you to beat the door down. Don't accept no, keep on going and get through and reach out to the troops because if I had knowledge when I was in command of a, a company of about 200 and about 280 including the civilians I would have loved to have these resources at my fingertips because I would have used them and I hope that helps Bob Absolutely. so um, we have other programs coming up here but uh, before we go on this particular program um, you know, we, I mentioned this earlier, we have a lot of men and women deployed in many different areas around the world. Would you all like to give a shout out to them? Uh, to all my brothers and sisters, men and women around the world serving in any conflict or supporting the conflicts, uh, be safe. We love you and uh, we hope you have a safe trip home. And I know I say this a lot, Keith, but thank you for your service. Thank you very much, brother. Absolutely. You go get me the mic back again? So, so you're actually going to give me the bike, and I'm the last one to say something. And you still want, you, oh, you're going to take it. See, I, that's the way it probably would go. Well, definitely, you know, lots of, lots of deployed servicemen all around the world. You know, even in the neighborhood I live in, we got lots of active duty, and they're deploying all the time. They don't make the headlines. But 
there is one service member I'd like to point out today, and he's not here right now. Um, today, today is my would have been my dad's 94th birthday, World War II vet, and uh, you know, um, I miss my dad. I know Bob does too, and he he definitely did struggle with a lot of stuff coming back from World War II. That was some messed up stuff over there, and. Um, Dad, we love you. Wish you could be here, but I know you can. I, I think you're looking down here, and and Dad, I think you'd be proud of this guy right here. He's done some good stuff. Actually, interesting that you bring that up. Um, when I started making trips to Iraq and Afghanistan, Mom and Dad, well, mostly Mom, she'll see this maybe. Um, why are you doing this? You've never been in the military. It's too dangerous. And then I'd keep going back, keep going back, and I remember coming back before he died. Um, it was the early 2007 at that first trip and he took me aside and he said I want you to know that I really appreciate what you're doing and I cannot tell you how much that meant to me and he died just soon after that so yeah we don't have many World War II veterans left so well thank you guys I appreciate it this has been very very this is really neat to have you guys together so to, to all of you around the, the world who are deployed um, and to all of our first responders all across America, um, we so appreciate your sacrifice and to all the veterans, uh, but to you, th those of you deployed and all of our first responders are out every day in cities across America, be safe, stay alert, and to our deployed troops, we look forward to you coming home. Uh, please share this video and the ones that are getting ready to follow with everybody you can. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America.